It's good to see you. I'm grateful for this time together and for the opportunity we've had to sing together and take the Lord's Supper together and pray together. And uh, it's a great blessing. It's the Lord's Day. It's also the day that uh, men have appointed, at least in our society, in our country, as being Mother's Day. Excuse me just a minute. Somehow this has gotten all twisted up. And I just got here, so I don't think that I did it at least today. Um, Mother's Day. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad that our society, uh, at, least, uh, at least in words, recognizes the importance of mothers. They are very important in our society, in any society. Um, I'm not sure how deep the appreciation runs by the way uh, we pass laws and the way we value people in our world. But be that as it may, we'll just take it as a good thing. And, and I, I want to think with you this morning uh, a lesson that uh, deals with the family. And I thought I'd like to, uh, to share with you the contrast uh, in two families that we read about in the Bible. Now, let me make mention of the fact that uh, this lesson has a particular value, I think, to those of us who uh, maybe are still uh, looking to, to, either we have young children at home or we're looking one day to marry and to have little children, raise children in this world. It's not lost on the rest of us either, I hope. Um, but it is, I think, significant to let the Lord teach us about how to bring a family from the beginning to fruition in this wicked world, this world that's always been wicked. And I thought maybe this contrast would be of use to you, so I appreciate your kind attention for a few minutes. I want to start with the family uh, of a lady named Eunice. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, Paul writes a letter to Timothy. It's the last letter the Holy Spirit has preserved for us in the, in the Bible of the Apostle Paul. He writes it to a beloved uh, brother. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. He said, I thank God when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in thee also. You have a hard time, I think, finding a, a, a man greater in the New Testament, a servant of the Lord greater than Timothy. Paul thought so anyway. His devotion was striking. We all remember in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19, uh, Paul wrote, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For, speaking of Timothy, I have no one like him who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how that as a son with a father, he hath served with me in the gospel. What a compliment for a man like Paul. I, can't, I don't have anybody available more selfless or as selfless as Timothy is. Uh, that's something that's not in great abundance in our world, I fear. The idea of, uh, of, of selflessness. Uh, but he was a devoted servant of God. You just look wherever you look on the map. Uh, if you look at some of the maps we have in our Bible of Paul's journeys, for example, Paul's first journey, uh, you remember with, uh, with Barnabas, uh, took him from Antioch to the island of Cyprus and then up through uh, Perga and Pamphylia and uh, through uh, the cities here of Galatia, planning the gospel, coming back and ordaining elders in every church. And it must have been on this first trip that uh, Timothy was you know, perhaps converted. He, it seems to be from this area of Lystra here. That's so tiny on the map, I can't see it. I know you can't. But... Um, uh, then when you get to the second journey, you certainly find 
Paul, uh, I think by direct revelation from God, taking Timothy with him and making uh, him a companion in all the preaching and teaching that was done uh, as they went to Troas on the second journey and then over into uh, Macedonia. Uh, and then the third journey as Paul again takes Timothy and uh, the, the preaching that's done in Ephesus and these other places. Um, again, it's a, it's a credit to Timothy and his, uh, his constancy and his selfless service. What a great man that he was. Paul would write about him in his letters and repeatedly refer to him, you remember, as my own son, my child, my beloved child. He wasn't his physically, of course. He was somebody's child physically. He was Eunice's child physically. And so how does a young man become such a very successful and useful uh, servant of the Lord? Well, it's a great question. What was it that made Timothy great? Uh, I'll tell you what it wasn't. You know this. It wasn't the great moral climate in which he lived. He just lived in a time when people just didn't like sin. He was just in a time when there wasn't much temptation and things were rosy and it, it, it never rained on Saturday and it was just a great old day. No, actually, he lived in a time when it was really a, a bad, polluted climate. You read Romans chapter 1, very much like our society, uh, where Paul, there you remember, talks about the corruption of his day and how that uh, men were um, uh, devoted, it seems, to sin, filled with unrighteousness, Romans 1, 29. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. We didn't just invent that in America in the last few years. It's been around a long time, hasn't it? Timothy grew up in a world like that, very much the world in which we live. And so that wasn't it. It wasn't that he was free from temptation. It wasn't because of the peaceful religious situation in the community. We're not given maybe this much detail, but you know, Paul was stoned to death, I think, at Lystra, and God raised him up. Timothy may have witnessed that violence. He certainly saw the persecution of the gospel and later felt that as a teacher of the gospel. So it wasn't that uh, the path was always smooth and the reception always welcoming. It wasn't because there weren't problems in the church. There were plenty of problems in the church and Timothy had to deal with that. It wasn't uh, any of those things. I'll tell you something else it wasn't. It wasn't because he had such a great example as a father. We don't know anything about Timothy's father except Acts 16 tells us he was a Greek, that is a Gentile. He may have been a good provider. I don't know what kind of man he was, but he certainly was not a spiritual influence. Let me tell you, I would not recommend to anybody that you join up in marriage with a woman or a man who is not going to be a spiritual influence. We've said that repeatedly. I don't mind saying it again. You're setting yourself up for a very long, difficult road that puts not only your soul in jeopardy, but your children's soul in jeopardy. It's a difficult thing. People have come through it. Timothy did not find spiritual strength in his father. His case was not such a case. I'll tell you where Timothy found his strength. And I think where ultimately his greatness was rooted. It was rooted in the fact that he came into uh, the world in an atmosphere of faith in God in his family. Faith in a faithless world. I'm thinking about that passage in 2 Timothy 1.5. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, Paul writes, of faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Faith. And I think there are several ways maybe in which that was true. Uh, I think it was true in the sense that he was raised in the faith. I think it was also true that he was raised with a sense of trust in God. And also perhaps if we, if we can stretch it a little bit, I think there must have been in that home a faithfulness, a steadfastness in doing right. 
all of which influenced Timothy. Let me say a word about those things and we'll move on. I, I think he was raised without question in an atmosphere where the faith was taught. What is it that Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us? The secret things belong to God, Moses wrote. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. There's an objective faith. There's a truth. A truth that we learn. A truth that we uh, then put into application. A truth that we live by. What does it mean to a young person to have that working in their life. Can I ask you to turn back quickly to Psalm 119? Most all of us who know anything about the Psalms, remember Psalm 119, it is the longest chapter in the Bible. Not really a chapter, is it? You know, it's not, not Psalm chapter 119. It's the 119th Psalm. But be that as it may, it, it is certainly, you know, a, a long uh, work, a glorious work. A work that surrounds the Word of God, doesn't it? And, and it's broken up in these sections. It's this uh, acrostic psalm. It's a marvelous psalm. Anyway, but look in verse 9, if you will. And consider with me these words. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? That's the old translation. Your translation may say something like this. How can a young man maintain a pure life or keep his life pure? That's a great question. That's the question that ought to be on the minds of, uh, of, uh, of Markel and of Reese and uh, all the other young fellows. We've got young ladies that we've got here for that matter. How can I stay pure? Well, what does he say? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. And then he adds, with my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. I have a hunger to know God's will and I meditate on that and it's what, it's what gets me through. It's what makes my, uh, my decisions for me. It's what helps me see right and wrong. It helps me avoid a lot of heartache. Here's an individual, a young person who is steeped in the word of God, raised in the faith. We know that about Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. I can tell you that uh, at a young age, I was devoted to learning all kinds of information that is completely useless. And I have, I have many facts floating around in my head that will not profit anybody. I remember the baseball lineup of this team. I can tell you who the starting offensive line was for that team. I don't guess that hurt me, but it's not, it's not going to really help me. Young folks have minds that are able to absorb, and they can absorb a lot of things. But if we can teach our young folks to be absorbed in the word of God. Now that's something that will help you your whole life and help you beyond. Timothy was that kind of fellow, raised in that kind of environment. He knew the holy scriptures. Um, I don't really have time to do this much, but I'm going to share it anyway. I, I've probably shared this with some of you before. A lot of us have, have maybe remember the name Irvin Lee. Uh, Bob Waldron was his son-in-law and sister Waldron, the daughter. Brother Lee was blessed with a great wife, Miss Otha Lee. She was originally a stubble field. And I've heard Brother Lee tell this story about how that uh, she grew up in a hard situation. Uh, she was the sixth of seven children. Just before the seventh child was born, the father dies. Now you've got a widow woman with seven children, no social security, didn't know such a thing existed or ever would exist. 
How in the world are they going to make it? Well, they, they worked. They uh, raised strawberries to sell. They, they raised some other crops that they ate, made their clothes. Uh, you think a mama like that's busy? You think she's got something to do with it? Now, the older children would be able to help out some, no doubt. But do you think, do you think this woman had a lot of idle time? I'm talking about uh, Miss Otha's mother. When she's just a little thing. No, you know exactly. You know, mamas are never blessed with a lot of idle time. But here's the thing. Brother Lee says, you know, you talk to my wife, she'll tell you, she can't remember when she learned the stories of Daniel and Moses and Abraham. She can't remember. She seems like she's always known them. From before she was able to really understand, she heard those names. How in the world does a mama with all of that on her have time to teach her little children? Well, Brother Lee would say, she learned that she could uh, tell Bible stories while she washed dishes. And she could tell Bible stories while she holds strawberries. And she could tell Bible stories while she sold clothes. You're talking about a home where the Word of God just permeated things. And children that grow up in that environment, despite whatever else is going on, when that's the priority, but what a gift that is, what a blessing that is. Timothy had that. I'm convinced he did. He not only had the word of God, he also was raised, I think, in an atmosphere of trusting God. That's what faith is, trust. I don't believe, I think it's fair to say, we're not told a lot of details about this, but I have no doubt in my mind that Timothy was not raised uh, in this case by a mother uh, in which she was just filled with all kind of worry and anxiety and, and fearfulness and frustration. Think about that passage in Matthew 6 that we've read so many times. Here's what the Lord said. I don't want you to be anxious about your life, about things like what you'll eat or drink or wear. I want you to look at the birds and see how they don't toil or spin. God takes care of them. You think you're worth more than a bird? How about looking at the grass of the field? It's the beautiful wild flowers that grow. God gave them that. You think God cares more about that than you? A flower that'll be here today and gone tomorrow? If God clothes them, you don't think he'll remember you? Therefore, verse 31, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need all of them. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We raise children up in an environment like the Lord is prescribing here. We'll have a good opportunity to raise a Timothy. The question is, do our children see that from us? In the third place, I think we can think about raising up someone in faith in the sense of faithfulness. Faithfulness is a term we use to describe consistency. Faithful. He's faithful. Um, it's, it's an environment of faithfulness. Uh, it, it's, every day is the same in that regard. You know, you grow up in a household where it's not a question of, hey, we're going to church this week or not. I don't know. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Well, obviously, it's the Lord's day, isn't it? Well, what else would we do? There are some decisions that are already made. We, we, we know what the priorities are. The discipline and instruction of the Lord become the guiding principles of everyday life. And, and you have a home that really lives up to that great passage in Romans chapter 2. Paul describes you know, two very different mindsets. And in this passage, it's the, it's the positive. He says, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. Boy, if, if, if that could be said of me and of my house, that's a success if I don't have $10 in the bank. To those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory Heavenly glory, honor, immortality. 
eternal life. That's the reward of such. I, I have no doubt Timothy grew up in that kind of an environment. It's very different in many households. To some, religion is more like a spasm than it is something consistent. Just, you know, you get a little jerk there once in a while. And, but the idea of, of laying a course and staying the course, because we know it's right, and we know the devil's going to throw garbage in the way, we'll clear that off. We go, this is our path. Raising Timothy in an environment like that. We read that passage, I do. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. We've read it many times. That's where Peter writes to these persecuted Christians and he says, Sanctify the Lord God of your hearts. Set him apart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And we've read that verse many times and we've said we ought to let the world see something different in us. We ought to let the world look at us and see this is a man going to a different place. He's listening to a different direction. He's got a hope in a hopeless world. Right. But Wesley, how about letting your kids be the ones that see that too? Not just the world. Let them see that in me. What was it the Lord said we read a moment ago? Seek first the kingdom. you got a, a man, a woman who seeks first the kingdom. It, it will stand out. They don't have to brag and boast to say, look at me. They're just going to live and make decisions. And people will notice. They think different. They value things different. And, and the, the, the blows don't affect them the same way. They, they hurt, they, they bleed, but they have a hope. Our kids will see that too. Okay. Let me, before I quit, look at another example that we've looked at before as well. Here's Timothy on the one side. Here's the family of Eunice. And then here's the family of Lot. And, you know, in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, and uh, in verse 6, Peter's writing about the, the judgment of God and how that God, even in judgment against the wicked, can distinguish the wicked from the righteous. And so in that context, he writes, that God at one point turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly, and deliver just Lot, righteous Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Then he adds parenthetically, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing uh, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. What a blessed man Lot was. And he was blessed in so many ways. He, he was the nephew of Abraham. What did Paul say? The father of us all? Uh, that'd be pretty nice to have an uncle like that. I had some pretty good fellows, but nothing like that. And he was with Abraham. When Abraham came out of, called out of Ur of Chaldea, uh, God, uh, by God, uh, there was Lot. And he comes up here to Haran, and uh, there's Lot. And he goes down into Canaan, and Lot's with him, and he comes down um, to, uh, um, to Shechem and builds an altar, Abraham does, and Lot's there. And then he comes down here between Bethel and Ai and builds another altar to God in this promised land, and, and Lot's with him. And then they go down to, uh, to Egypt. And when they come up out of Egypt, the text says back in Genesis 13 that they were wealthy that Abraham was wealthy and that Lot also, which went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. So you talk about Lot the blessed. He was blessed spiritually. He was blessed materially. And we might say he's got a bright future, but his family was a disaster. That's the only word you can use for that, an absolute wreck. Now, Genesis chapter 19 uh, is the story of the destruction of, of Sodom. And, and we'll just have to refer to that. It's familiar, I think, to most of this audience. When God sent the angels down there, 
uh, in order to prove the people. It wasn't that God didn't know what was going on, but it's sort of like one last chance. Oh, we'll just sleep here in the street. Lot meets them out there. No, 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 don't do the hill. He didn't know who they were, I'm convinced at this point, but he just knew that these were good people and uh, this is not a place for good people to be. Exactly. So come home with me. They finally go home with him. And then after they have eaten, the whole city turns out, all the men of the city, to, to demand that Lot give these men, his guests to them, that they might uh, sexually abuse them, um, rape them. And Lot says, no, I will not do that. And he just says something awful. Uh, there's no excuse for it. I, I don't know how to, to process it except to say that he must have just made this outrageous offer knowing that it would not be accepted of them. Uh, not, you can take my daughters if you want to, but no. Horrible. Of course, that's not what they're after. So eventually they threaten him with violence, and that's when the men pull Lot back in the door, strike the men with confusion, confusion, blindness. And they say to Lot, um, if you've got anybody in this city, you get them together because the destruction of this city is coming. Um, and um, verse 12 of chapter 19, the men said to Lot, hast thou here any beside, son-in-law, sons, daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this city, because the cry of them is waxen great. The Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went in and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up, get you out of this place, the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. I don't know. I've never been exactly sure how many relatives he had there. He had two daughters there in the house. Were they engaged to these fellows? Were these two more daughters and sons-in-laws? I, I don't know exactly. But what I know is that when they left that city, uh, they didn't have any of that uh, treasure or any of his flocks or herds or money or whatever he had, it was all gone. It was all about to be destroyed by fire and brimstone. And worst of all, even his family. You remember how the text tells us that his wife um, had uh, looked back, verse 25, 26, and she became a pillar of salt I mentioned this before. You know, when I first started reading the Bible and I read that story, I sort of had the idea somehow that it was like she was going out of the city and you ever had a, a you've been walking one direction, there's a noise behind you, you just flinch and turn around? I, I don't know, maybe that's what she did, but I don't really think God was trying to catch them. Uh, that would have violated what he said. He said, don't turn around, don't look back. But, but Jesus used Lot's wife in Luke 17 in an example uh, when he was talking about another destruction far removed from the time of Sodom. This was the destruction coming upon Jerusalem. And in, uh, in Acts, I'm sorry, Luke 17, and in verse 28, you remember how likewise, Jesus said, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and they drank and they bought and they sold and they planted and they builded. And the same day, that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which hath upon his, uh, he which shall be upon his housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. It's not Genesis that gives us maybe the most information, but the Lord's words here of what really happened on that day. That's where her heart was. That's where all her stuff was. That's where she wanted to be. But it was marked for destruction, and as a result, she likewise perished. The worst thing that ever happened to Lot back over in Genesis 19 was after they escaped and after they wound up in a cave up in the mountains, it was uh, 
Lot and his two daughters who felt that uh, they were uh, just waiting to die at that point. Uh, and so they came up with a truly devilish plan. Um, the firstborn, 31 of Genesis 19, said to the younger, Our father is old, there is not a man of the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Let us make our father drink wine and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they thought if we get him drunk enough, he won't know the difference between reality and fantasy and we can, we can work this work and we can thus have conceived children. Which they did, by the way, and that's where the Moabites and the Ammonites came from, as he tells us later. But we cringe at this monstrous act. And where in the world do two young women come up with an idea like this? Well, they grew up in Sodom. That's, that's exactly the point. It's the story of a righteous man who lost everything, everything. And it hinged on a decision, you know, back in the 13th chapter. In brighter days... When they came out of Egypt and, and Abraham said, you know, we, we've got a strife between our herdsmen here. We've got so much stuff, but there's a big land. I'll tell you what. He said, uh, you just decide which way you want to go and I'll go the other. And so Lot looked down to the south and he saw that plain of Jordan that it was well watered. Uh, it, it looked like the Garden of Eden before the Lord destroyed it. And so he chose to pitch his tent towards Sodom. Verse 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Apparently that didn't make much of an impression on him. I don't know how much he knew about that, but I'll tell you what, it turned out to be the important thing, didn't it? Why did Lot choose to live in Sodom? Ignorance, did he just not know? If he didn't know how wicked it was, it wouldn't have taken him long down there to figure it out. Oh, he just loved sin. No, he didn't. He hated it. Hated it. As much as you do. He hated sin. It vexed his soul from day to day to day to day. Well, then why in the world would he choose that? Why would he stay there? The only conclusion I can give is from what is said, he said it was well watered. It was great for business. If you're in the cattle business or in the sheep herding business, this is the place for you. And I can almost hear a man like Lot, who was a righteous man, saying to himself, look, I know these people are bad. I'll just hold my nose and, and do my business. I am never going to join these people. I can't stand what they do. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. And he was. But his family wasn't. He lost them all. So, uh, as we might say, Sodom was a great place to raise sheep. It wasn't a great place to raise children. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. It's amazing how the wind can shape rocks in a certain place and cut them in ways that just are stunning. It's amazing how a sculptor can take a lump of clay and mold it and shape it. That's what happens in our environment. What if, what if? What if back at that fateful day, Lot had said to Abraham, tell you what, I appreciate you offering it to me, but why don't you choose the way you want to go and then choose for me and tell me which way to go to? That would have been much better, wouldn't it? You think it might have turned out differently? It might have made all the difference. But it's easy to be blinded. And it's hard sometimes to get ourselves to listen. Two families. And I can look at them and I can say, well, I think Lot's got a lot better opportunity here. I mean, he's got... And I can look at, uh, at uh, Eunice and I could say, boy, I don't know how she's going to make it. I think in one sense, it gives me hope that even though Eunice, that great lady, did not have a lot of advantages that, that we would like to have, she found a way. God be her helper. 
And I can look over here and I can see in Lot a very sobering warning that you can be a righteous man and lose it all. So let me close with two passages that you're well familiar with. One is Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And I'm talking particularly now to those whose children are still young and around your feet or one of these days you're planning in the next five years or so to marry, to have a family. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord one. Lord alone. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And he said, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That's right. We can win this battle. The most important fight that we'll fight. We can win it and we can pass that knowledge along. But it will not come easy. The devil will make sure of that. There have been folks a lot better than I am, a lot smarter than I am, better hearts than I got, who've met with bitter disappointment in their family because of influences that came from somewhere else, not from them. So I'm, I'm reminding you of something I trust all of us know. We've got to guard our house. We've got to determine to set the right priorities in our house. We have got to focus our mind on the thing that matters. I'll tell you something, you've heard this before, but it is a fact. I've had opportunity to watch a few people uh, leave this world. And I, 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 I've not yet found anybody that when they were hours less from death, were thinking about all the money they'd made or how big the car was. The people that I knew that had any, well, if they don't have any orientation to God, they're just scared to death. And those who do have an orientation to God are thinking about things spiritual. And many times about loved ones that while they're leaving this earth, are not ready to meet God at that moment. Let us do our best with God's help to leave this life with a clear conscience. And we can, in the process, bless the world with a Timothy. And may God help us to that end. Okay, appreciate your kind attention. Please get out your songbooks and turn the number that's been selected. God calls us to be in his family. <clears throat> he wants us to learn from him. He wants us to live here in such a way that we might be prepared to live with him for eternity. That's the, the greatest gift that we can ever have. And we look forward to that. May it, may it motivate me and, and influence me every day. If you're here and you're ready to start your service to God, you do that a heart of faith, the heart of repentance, coming forward confessing Jesus' name without shame, being baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Why not today make that your, your goal? Make that yours. If you're here as one who's a child of God, if you've not been faithful to the Lord, why not today make things right with him? If we can help you in any way, let us know how. While we stand and sing, will you come?